All right. In the podcast you're about to listen to, I want to make a quick clarification. Um, I wanted to talk about the missing middle, but I ended up mostly talking about the manifestation of the effects of the missing middle. Um, So quickly, I'm going to kind of define the missing middle in its two scopes, which is the kind of architectural real estate missing middle and the occupational missing middle. So on an abstract level, the missing middle is the lack of options for both intermediate and transient positions in a system. So what that means is that in the job world, the missing middle refers to uh, kind of the lack of stepping stones or rungs on the ladder between you know the bottom end jobs and the high end jobs. And in real estate, the missing middle basically means that you have, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you've got single family homes or, um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have, you know, multi-story condo high rises. Due to the nature of a single family home being far away from a city center, usually requiring a car um, and being on a relatively large plot of land because in a with single family homes the home itself really doesn't hold the value the land holds the value that half acre parcel or however big it is um, the ratio of living space to plot size is usually a, a very large or that there's a lot there's a lot of the land compared to the living area in a, a single family home which keeps the price of single family homes high because as we know you know land is the commodity mark twain once said uh buy land they're not making it anymore so um that's one in the spectrum the other in the spectrum is when um, these developers are constrained into smaller areas and they build multi-level apartments and condos that due to the architectural challenges of building you know a 20-story tower or or greater in a city well they pass those costs on to their tenants and the form of higher rent. So the missing middle in architectural terms means, you know, buildings that don't use a, as much land as a single family home, that have a much higher ratio of living space to the footprint of the building and the footprint of the plot, um, while also not being built so big and tall that the added costs of engineering and architecture cancel out the um, the savings of consolidation and being more space efficient. So the missing middle manifests itself in a lack of options and choice where people, you know, are forced to, you know, bunk together and, you know, split the ticket with a house or an apartment um, where they have roommates or they're living at home with their mom and dad and they're stuck in the rent trap and they're never able to uh, save up enough money to buy a single family home. Not that they want to because, well, those are the only options. Like live in a downtown condo or live in a single family home. Those are your options. The missing middle is refers to the lack of options and the lack of choice and the lack of those intermediate price points. Something that isn't living at home with mom and dad but also isn't, you know, buying your own home or very expensive downtown condo. So I just wanted to clarify that because I kind of gloss over what the missing middle is in the beginning of this podcast and go more about how its effects manifest. But I really wanted to focus on um, the missing middle in job opportunities. The only jobs I didn't really mention in this podcast are work remote because they're kind of an X factor. Um, work remote jobs, I... Uh, I don't really think that there's a solution to um, small towns issues because as we've seen like work remote jobs as they uh, go to Guatemala and Mexico and other parts like there's an entire that's an entire separate discussion for about how remote workers are a menace in their own right when you have people who earn you know 10 to 20 times as much as the locals just waltzing into town and then asking the town to be sculpted around their socioeconomic status. That is an entire separate problem that I'll probably talk about at a future point. But uh, for anyone who wants to listen to this podcast and say, well, the solution is we're remote workers, more remote workers. 
Um, I'll address that at a later point. But uh, until then, um, yeah, this is just kind of like a little uh, clarification before you start this podcast. And uh, enjoy. Okay, everybody. Welcome back. So today, instead of me just rambling about random small town development stuff and all that stuff, I'm going to try to record what I recorded a few days ago. I had an issue with the mic. Um, I was actually recording on my motorcycle, which probably was not the smartest idea ever because all I recorded was a bunch of wind noise. I need a, if I ever try that again, I need to get my mic in a better position within my helmet. But um, I'll try to cover a lot of what I said there from memory. But uh, I want to talk about the missing middle um, in two capacities. So for those of you that um, have never heard about the missing middle, um, typically it's, uh, you see it in housing where um, traditionally the missing middle refers to, well, you know, you're living with your parents, you're living in your mom's basement, or, you know, you're stuck in the rent trap. Um, And that's on one side. And then on the other side, you've got, you know, the prospect of home ownership. And it's less about the type of home it could be a town home, it could be a house in the country, it could be a suburban home. Um, it's just like, you know, you're not renting um, and you, you have a house. And the missing middle kind of refers to, uh, financially speaking, the, the divide between those two extremes. Where, you know, either, you know, living at home, living with your parents, um, and then uh, renting a room with some buddies, you know, everyone's, you know, pitching in to rent a house or something like that. And then you've also got, um, you know, people who are like renting a single bedroom apartment in Denver or wherever they are. And um, they're looking for a path to home ownership. And uh, there's really just not many options in the middle. And especially if you're in the rent trap, it's hard to save up the money for a down payment so that's why they call it the rent trap. So that's the uh, real estate housing um, definition of the missing middle. But um, in addition to that, we also have kind of the uh, the occupational missing middle, you know, the job missing middle. Because um, on one end of the spectrum, you've got, you know, hourly workers, you know, people working at fast food restaurants, a lot of service industry, um, you know, jobs that kind of flirting around minimum wage, maybe a little bit more. So you got jobs like that, and there's many jobs like that. You know, hour, not, yes, there are people out there that have hourly work that's in like the $45, $50 an hour. Like if you're a plumber or an electrician, you could even be around $90 or $100 an hour. So it's not like hourly employees in general, but typically, you know, entry-level jobs, um, stuff that's paying under $20 an hour in 2023. Um, And uh, for the mountain town specifically, this includes a lot of seasonal work, you know, river guides, mountain guides, um, ski instructors, lifties. So we've got that in the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got, you know, salaried employees, you know, doctors, lawyers, um, business owners, like very profitable business owners, I guess you could say. But there's really nothing in the middle. So, you know, you've got stuff there where it's like under $20 an hour. And then you have, you know, you start to see stuff in like the 40K on the very, very low end, working your way up to... Um, you know, buku bucks, you know, millions of dollars a year. So financially, there's very few jobs in the middle. And uh, this leads to kind of a barrier, like a valley, 
where it's really hard to transition from one side to the other in the same way how it's hard to transition out of the rent trap to a path to home ownership it's very hard to transition from an hourly position that doesn't pay very well to an hourly position that pays more or better and then maybe getting to a salaried position and we kind of call this the missing middle and the missing middle really started to become a problem when we offshored a lot of industry we sent a lot of um, American domestic manufacturing jobs or resource extraction jobs overseas. You know, we gave them to China, we gave them to other countries that could do it cheaper. So we still had our service industry employees, you know, waitresses, waiters, um, but we got rid of everything in between. So we're a country of, you know, baristas and lawyers. And there is such a socioeconomic divide between those two types of people. And we don't really provide many paths for anyone to get from point A to point B. There is no, well, it's point A to point C and there is no point B. And uh, the role of domestic manufacturing and resource extraction kind of used to be this intermediate career path where, you know, you could work there and put in your time and then because the, the reality is, is like unless you make manager at McDonald's you know there's not much you're not doing on day one that you aren't doing on day 101 versus in the world of manufacturing and resource extraction there is a skill tree there is a way for you to learn more skills over time at the job itself without requiring to be educated and pay for that education at an institution it's possible for you to develop those skills just by working there long enough. And um, we really don't do that anymore. We, a lot of education these days that is something where like employers like expect you to like go to seminars and hopefully they, they pay for it, but like so much education happens outside the workplace. And that does put it in a position where the employer puts a lot of educational cost on the employee which again goes into like the modern workplace culture where many employees that are in the um, hourly bracket, you know, people who aren't doctors and lawyers are seen as expendable and replaceable. Uh, basically the lawyer says, well, yeah, if you're not, or not the lawyer, <laughs> basically the company says, well, if you're not willing to pay out of your own pocket for this seminar, well, then we'll just find somebody else who will. That's kind of an extreme case, but I'm sure there's people out there who have experienced that. But the missing middle is something that we, uh, if we want to have a strong middle class of people who aren't destitute and also people who don't have so much money that they are very much so uh, dissolute, or I don't want to say dissolution, but if they're detached from reality because they live in their own little bubble, like, why doesn't everyone own a Tesla? Why doesn't everyone, you know, have a golden, gold-plated healthcare plan like me? Why doesn't everyone else live like I do in my gated community? Because, you know, we have that. It's like the haves and the have-nots. And there's no way for have-nots to become haves because there are none of these jobs in the middle that could help anyone elevate their station. They're kind of on their own, which is a bummer. So, to bring back domestic manufacturing in a sustainable fashion, because a lot of people say, we don't want those dirty domestic manufacturing jobs or resource extraction jobs in our country. They're filthy, they're disgusting, they're dirty, they're greasy. We'd rather have other countries overseas that don't have the EPA and don't have OSHA to handle those jobs. <laughs> Which is just kind of like, you know, you're trying to protect your own environment, but you know, we all live on the same planet. So you're like, well, you know, we're not, you know, we have put in regulations in place that have disincentivized companies to do those particular things here. So those companies still do them, they just do them elsewhere, someplace without as many regulations. So it's a matter of like, okay, we need regulations to protect the environment and to protect workers' rights. But we also don't have so many regulations that, you know, we regulate the industry out of existence and then 
the industries overseas paying people, you know, cents on the dollar to do the same type of work. And um, they're in a country which doesn't require scrubbers on their exhaust vents, so they just dump the dirty air straight out into the atmosphere and, you know, run their wastewater directly into the river because, well, you know, it's uh, somewhere in the middle of Africa, somewhere in the middle of China. Uh, either they don't have regulations or you can pay off the uh, local inspectors. That's just the way it's done. So in the end, you know, our effort to protect our environment just endangers everyone else's. So that's why, like, as a community and as a country, we need to have an attitude of, like, okay, where's the happy medium where we can be satisfied with, like, you know, workers are being protected, environment is being protected, but also we still have industry. We haven't sent it all over shore. It's kind of the process of deglobalization of, like, how do we bring manufacturing jobs back without, you know, just, you know, building a facility in the middle of Nebraska, filling it with robots, having one or two well-played, you know, well-paid uh, plant managers to, you know, watch some computer monitors all day and they're saying, oh, look, we bought domestic ma manufacturing back. Yay us. It's like, well, no, you, you created two jobs, two very well-paying jobs, I imagine. But, you know, you've got, you've hired out all these robots to do the work that, you know, a bunch of sweatshop workers in China were previously doing. So is that progress? I'm not sure, but um, that's one of the issues I kind of have with the Silicon Valley automation economy of, you know, you guys are eliminating jobs left and right, not realizing the social costs of um, eliminating all those jobs. Or like, automation is good for the owners of companies. It's not good for really uh, the workers of companies. So... Um, yeah, you know, I can see in the next 10, 20 years, America definitely will start to have a lot more domestic manufacturing. But the question is, is that manufacturing going to be so heavily automated that it really doesn't make a difference in the job market? Which is kind of what I think is going to happen. You know, we will be making more things here domestically, but we'll only create probably 10% of the jobs that you would if you actually hired out people. Because of, again, this heavy reliance on automation and then just having a couple of very well-paid tech professionals basically babysit the robots in some massive factory in the middle of Montana or Idaho or wherever they decide to build it. Probably where land and power is cheap and far away from everything else. But circling around, this is where I put the importance on the resurgence of American railroads because railroads do require a very, very large uh, domestic workforce. And due to the nature of a railroad, you know, kind of being a thing in a specific location, usually between a couple of different locations, um, railroad jobs are very difficult to outsource. Uh, unless you want to like play the, the card of like, well, we outsource the railroad jobs by reducing American manufacturing so much that the rail traffic decreased to the point that the railroads had to scale back the amount of employees that they have. Like, okay, that's okay. That's the way how railroads technically get outsourced. But the writing on the wall says that um, domestic trucking, you know, long distance, long haul trucking, which I guess there isn't any other form of trucking other than domestic. I mean, yeah, I understand there's trucks that go to between the US and Canada and Mexico. So technically that's international trucking. I digress. But, um, I do see a world in which trucking starts to take a bit of a back seat, um, mostly due to energy costs. And um, you know, I've said this once, I'll say it again. Um, trucking is a government subsidized industry. Uh, trucking companies do not pay their fair share into um, the amount of uh, maintenance and upkeep to keep the highway system that they are dependent upon working. Uh, you know, all of our taxes, like we all, we all support. I know people get upset when like say, oh, we all support Amtrak, even though Amtrak doesn't support us. Well, we all, uh, in our taxes, we all do pay into domestic, oh, we all pay into trucking. And I would say trucking does support all of us. It's just a very inefficient way 
to move stuff around. I mean, it's rubber tires on asphalt versus, you know, steel wheels on steel rails. Um, in general, you know, depending on what the truck is carrying, one freight train carries around the same amount of cargo of either 500 to 800 trucks, depending on um, what the truck is carrying. Now, in this country, rail tends to carry the largest mass and volume, but trucks carry more value because trucks tend to be carrying, you know, you, typically you've got a truck with a, a semi full of iPhones and a, um, and a freight train full of grain because uh, the truckers don't want to haul grain. That's a very low value, high bulk commodity. They want to, like, if you're a trucker, you want to basically haul around stuff that's like gold, you know, stuff that is small and compact and very valuable because that's how you make the most out of your trip. Because the reason why truckers like carrying high value commodities is because they know their system is so inefficient. They can't make money hauling bulk goods. Um, they, they want to be hauling very high, like basically an Amazon Prime truck, you know, something full of a million and one little consumer products because they know that they can't make money if they're not hauling, you know, basically gold bullion. Which is, you know, is very telling of the trucking industry of the things they don't want to touch and the things that you know, are kind of left over for the rail industry to pick up. But like I said, you know, trucking is very inefficient. Um, we've known this for a very long time. Um, there's also been kind of the assault on the truck driver and again from Silicon Valley with, you know, self-driving semis. So, you know, even though the self-driving technology is just around the corner, trust me, I'm Elon. Uh, the message has been sent to the uh, trucking industry and um, there's been a decline in the people that are seeking out CDLs. And uh, they, they basically say, like, this is a dead-end job. I mean, why would I bother spending all this money? Again, with the whole, you know, companies asking individuals to pay for, you know, the cost of training. Um, and people who would be w wanting to become truck drivers are basically saying, like, why would I uh, waste my time and money to get a CDL to work in trucking for a few years only to have an automatic truck completely replace my... Um, my job and it's like fair point um, and that's the message that Elon Musk with his self-driving Tesla semi kind of sent the trucking industry about 10 years ago and since then you know we, the numbers are like it's, it's very hard to find truck drivers so trucking is kind of in decline for multiple reasons the inefficiency the lack of willing you know new drivers to enter the labor pool um, and in addition to all that, you could also say that it is just, you know, the rising costs of fuel and the rising cost of living. Lots of truckers have said, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, like I was earning, you know, 100K, you know, or 150K. I owned my own truck. I owned my own rig. I just did job. I, I um, did various short haul, haul, long haul jobs like the independent trucker. Um, and like small trucking companies, but you know, kind of the, the glory days are over. I mean, yes, there's a huge demand for trucking, but there's a lack of drivers, fuel is getting expensive, and automation is just around the corner that'll make the entire truck driving profession completely obsolete. Now, <laughs> I'm skeptical about, you know, self-driving trucks completely making the truck driving profession obsolete. I think that's very much so wishful thinking. Um, I definitely think that, you know, trucking is complicated. I mean, like, yeah, you can have a self-driving truck, but is the truck going to be able to, you know, swap its own trailer or, you know, load and unload itself, get the drop gate down? I mean, it's like that's Silicon Valley's view of like, well, trucking is simple. Like a truck drives from point A to point B. It's like, that's just, that's just one part of what a truck does. You know, what happens when a self-driving truck goes over a way station and somebody made an issue um, or somebody had an issue in the loading and the truck's in, you know, a couple thousand pounds overweight? Is the AI in the truck just going to be like, um, you know, error, error, does not compute, self-destruct? <laughs> Probably not. But it might just sit there on the, on the scale going like uh, waiting further instructions from HQ. 
So, and oh yeah, also the way station's out in the middle of freaking nowhere in Arizona, and there is no 5G LTE ultra uber fast 10,000 gigabytes per second internet connection. So the thing, you know, it's SATCOM link is down because some bird pooped on it or something. And the truck's just sitting there, you know, basically with the, the hourglass spinning, you know, not knowing what to do. Hasn't been programmed to deal with a specific situation. And that's typical of Silicon Valley. They, they tend not to think outside of Silicon Valley and not understand how the real world works and how complicated things can get. Or maybe if they're not complicated, they're unaware and have no experience dealing with such things. So, you know, the future of trucking is probably never gonna go away, but it's probably gonna get scaled back tremendously. Um, which would be interesting to see. And at the time that trucking is scaling back, I hope rail scales up, that we sent, we ship more of our goods and commodities by rail. And, um, you know, if trucking took a lot of service away from rail because they would transport high value commodities faster and on a more flexible schedule, then that incentivizes the rail industry to upgrade its, uh, its infrastructure. Because if you're starting to swing all these, you know, Amazon Prime contracts to, you know, deliver goods from ports of entry to distribution hubs, then, um, yeah, you, you know, Amazon's a big juicy customer. And, you know, Union Pacific, BNSF, they might be like, hey, like, if we want to maintain this, like, very, very lucrative Amazon Prime contract, we might need to increase our speed and... Uh, you know, maybe you'll see an end of precision scheduled railroading where, you know, as you know, if, if you can, like precision scheduled railroading is on one end of the spectrum. And then, you know, trucking is on the complete other. Like trucking is very, very small, you know, individual trucks going to individual locations on their own schedule, you know, hopefully as quickly as possible versus precision scheduled railroading is, you know, network fluidity. How do we put as much stuff on one train as possible that's all going to the same direction. The train ends up being three miles long um, with, you know, eight engines on it with a couple scattered in between those uh, distributed power units. And uh, yeah, that's the entire idea of like, you know, let's try to, um, much like farming, <laughs> the modern rail industry is inefficient, aside from like its rolling resistance and its fuel economy, but just like farming, the only thing that U.S. farming and really farming as a whole is really good at it is uh, maximizing the productivity of the system against the fewest number of humans in the system. So you can think about it as the number of farmers compared to um, how much produce they produce or how many acres of farmland they tend. That's what precision scheduled railroading it is, is how few crew do we need to move the largest amount of stuff possible. And hopefully um, we do see precision scheduled railroading, which is very much like a Wall Street stock bro approach to railroading. You know, we want to see that kind of decline and be replaced more with traditional railroading, which was smaller trains, more of them on their own schedules, going where they need to go in an efficient and timely manner uh, versus, you know, these big unit trains just going from point A to point B where they don't even bother to swap out the locomotives. And that's how you get what's called foreign power. That's when you're on the North Fork and Southern and then you see a Union Pacific engine roll by and you're like, what the hell is that doing here? Well, that's foreign power. The reason being is that Union Pacific locomotive or like five of them are lashed up to a uh, mile long, two mile long grain train from Nebraska on its way to Virginia for some reason. And uh, they, the, they cannot even be bothered to swap out the uh, locomotives with Norfolk Southern locomotives, which uh, given Norfolk Southern recent um, escapades, I can understand why they would um, want to have the PR of it not being them. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's one of those things. That's why foreign power exists. It's a efficiency and cost savings measure. It takes time, it takes crew time to switch out locomotives. And if really the only thing you're changing is the paint and the number of, on the locomotive, well, why bother? Just, you know, through run the entire system. 
but still, yeah. The railroad industry needs to get with the times and, you know, increase its speed, increase its connectivity, uh, run more trains, hopefully smaller trains, which would be a great PR thing because, you know, people get pissed off about, a, you know, a three mile long freight train crawling through their town, completely cutting the town apart for hours. It's like, well, you know, if you ran smaller trains, then, you know, even if it's moving at the same speed, it won't cut up the town as much. But uh, this leads me all the way back around to the missing middle. So we need to bring back domestic manufacturing jobs, but that might end up just being a robot circus. So the next best thing is to have a, a strong domestic railroad industry that hires locally. Because like I said, you can't really outsource railroads overseas. It doesn't really work that way. And uh, that missing middle being filled with these railroad jobs would give people who like maybe only graduated high school or people who live in a small town that don't want to work in the service industry or the seasonal industry. It would give them a chance to get a year round career that would be quite beneficial to the local economy. Because the issue with small mountain towns and uh, the, the year round economy is that really mountain towns like Salida, BB, Leadville, even Breckenridge and Vale kind of have this problem of they kind of get two massive injections of cash each year. You know, they get their primary injection in the winter if they're a ski town, but if they're like a rafting town like Salida, then like they get two injections of cash, you know, one in the summer, one in the winter. That's when the business owners are doing really well. That's when, you know, the seasonal employees are able to get like $100 handshakes. And that's when the service industry employees are hopefully making, you know, really good tips on the weekends. But then we enter the mud months and uh, the happy time's over for a while. And at that point, you know, it really the town's kind of like on life support coasting through the fall and the summer. Like the fall, you might see a little bit of more traffic, but uh, the spring, the spring is definitely kind of a, Again, that whole climate thing with the failure to launch, like, is it spring? Is it still winter? Is it actually summer? You know, make up your mind, Colorado. Make up your mind, climate. But, um, yeah, the spring is tough. You know, the seasonal employees don't even have jobs. The service industry employees are not getting tips. And all the business owners in town are kind of restricted to kind of domestic town traffic. They're restricted to, you know, the people in town that can't afford to eat out um, while everyone else just kind of hunkers down and, you know, tries to make it to the summer or the winter, respectively. So, if you live in a small mountain town that happens to be along a rail line that could be reactivated, you know, yes, that rail line would bring lots of good jobs to the valley that would run 24-7, 365, you know, that's why it's important that, you know, freight service be included in the conversation. Because freight service does run all the time, we're passenger service, which we'd like to see it run all the time, but again, there might be more of a surge of passenger service during the uh, winter and summer, or at least more people on the trains. Hopefully the trains continue to run their normal schedule and don't completely cut back. Because, hey, you know, having a reliable train timetable is useful if you live in a small town and you want to get to Denver or someone in Denver wants to come visit their friend in Salida. But still, you know, imagine a world in which there were, you know, a set of employees in a small mountain town that do get a good paycheck. All, you know, you know, every single, well, not every single week, all tw they get 26 good paychecks a year. They work through the fall, they work through the spring, and they're supporting their families. And, you know, maybe they go out to eat, you know, some of that money does make its way back into the local economy. You know, having these people with these well-paying, you know, good benefits, retirement, long-term, not gonna be outsourced jobs. So in a town like BB, you know, there's only so many business owners in town that can kind of, you know, and even the, like I said, the business owners, they're still ebbing and flowing with the tourism. But then everyone else, you know, like that's why you have what's called like the Salida Shuffle or like the Mountain Shuffle. 
it's where people move from the river to the mountain, you know, back and forth each year. But a lot of them go back home during the fall and spring. So the, uh, the populations of the towns kind of constrict in the fall and spring because there's no work. So even if you are a, a business owner, you're basically coasting off of the earnings from the summer uh, when it gets, goes through fall, and then you're coasting off the earnings of the winter when you go through spring. But if you had a, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the percentage would be, say like 5%, 10% of the population of a small mountain town, which is not unbelievable, you know, works with the railroad. You know, you got people in dispatch, administration, maintenance of way, crew, you know, yard operations, all that jazz. And those people are pulling, you know, 26 good paychecks a year. Some of that money will make its way back to the local economy. And this is where I like a passenger service to be included in this conversation too, because um, say you don't want to run a freight train, say you don't want to run dispatch, um, but there are those people in town that would be willing to work for the railroad, but in a much more comfortable environment, like, hey, they can work at a station. They can, you know, work at the, work the tickets. They can be a conductor checking tickets. They could work in the cafe car. They could be like the equivalent of an attendant. I mean, is it all just conductors? I mean, again, with a lack of rail knowledge in this country, I even sometimes struggle to think about like, what's the equivalent of a flight attendant on an Amtrak train? Is it like a train attendant or just, are they all called conductors? I don't know. But that's an, that is a huge swath of jobs that would be available. I mean, I'm even thinking about like the elderly or, you know, older folks, people who don't want to, you know, do the physical labor of like running a train or maintaining track. It's like, hey, can you check tickets? Hey, can you, can you run the bar cart? Like these are jobs that would be running year round and would be, you know, relatively low impact, you know, on a physical level because seasonal and service work is very high impact and usually restricted to like diehards and the young. Um, it's very hard to get a job, you know, like say at Monarch, you know, there's, there's very, very few, you know, comfortable jobs for people, you know, north of 50 that aren't, you know, a ski bump. It's like, you know, working in the, in the souvenir gift shop, you know, sports shop, you know, working in rentals, like those jobs are kind of, kind of tough to snag. There's a lot of competition because everybody knows they're a pretty sweet gig. And if you are, a, you know, older and not as physically capable, you might be looking for one of those jobs, but now you're, you just, there's a lot more competition. So, and uh, the missing middle can also extend beyond just, you know, okay, reactivate the railroad, bring a bunch of railroad jobs back to the valley. It's like, well, you know, to make the railroad system work pretty well, we're gonna need an entire comprehensive system system of transit you know gig apps like uber and lyft i do not consider to be solutions to the missing middle um, i'm sure many of you have already seen you know kind of like uber tell all stories where it's like you know you effectively are making like three dollars an hour you know uber's you know a crowdfunded scam almost you know uber gets wealthy lyft gets wealthy but it's usually at the expense of their employees um, yeah, the burnout gig economy. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. There's plenty of videos on YouTube you can check out about kind of like the dark side of Uber, the dark side of Lyft, um, why there's always promotions for new drivers but never promotions for older drivers because the older drivers tend to have figured out the system doesn't work and they're like, screw this, I'm out. But uh, in Chaffey County, you know, we've got the Rocky Mountain Taxi and we've got the Chaffey County Shuttle. These are fantastic services and we're never really gonna have like a bus system. Although the other day I was up in uh, Leadville and I saw a bus from Summit County. And I was just like, whoa, that's weird. I mean, like seeing a city bus, like a city style bus in Leadville is like, what, what the hell is that doing here? That's, that's weird. Um, it did kind of, I was taken aback a bit by looking at that bus. But, um, you know, having more transit jobs available, you know, more bus tank routes running, more, more shuttles running, more Rocky Mountain taxis running, um, having a car share program, of which there might be a handful of employees that, you know, just kind of do maintenance on the vehicles. Car share programs are really cool. And I know there's like that one company is like Truvo, where like you can basically, it's kind of like Lyft or Uber, where you can like lease out your own vehicle 
which would again be a source of income. It's kind of like an Airbnb for your vehicle. We're like, hey, I'm not using my uh, Tacoma this weekend. I'm just gonna be, you know, hanging out at the house. But if someone's coming into Salida by train and uh, they want to um, rent my Tacoma from me for the weekend so they can go up to Gunnison or up Poncha Pass or go over to St. Elmo, yeah, yeah, they can totally use my car and I get, I get money, um, which is great. Um, the only issue with those apps is I don't want to see them like be co-opted by the big corporations pretending to be small people in the same way how Airbnb um, is usually large development corporations pretending to be individuals so they get all the benefits and mercy of being like little old Granny Smith trying to rent out her cabin, but little old Granny Smith owns 50 cabins. They're all bouged up and they're all owned by the same, you know, Wall Street hedge fund investment corporation. <laughs> So yeah, there is a future of like car share programs where people can come to a mountain town by bus or by train and then, you know, still be able to drive around to all of the places in which there aren't bus routes or um, what otherwise, you know, say they need it, they're going to be taking some gear with them and they don't want to take all that gear on the bus. I mean, buses can store a lot of stuff, uh, stuff, just be aware of that, but still, you know, there's that mentality in American culture of like, oh, to, to go hiking, I need my own Tacoma or Subaru so I can throw my backpack and tent in the back. Or it's like, you know, go over to Europe and backpack for a bit. I mean, honestly, a lot of problems could be solved with just, you know, you could take the most diehard NIMBYs that are against bringing any rail service back, improving any rail service, adding bus service. Just buy them a ticket and send them to either Amsterdam or somewhere in Switzerland and just have them experience that level of transit convenience. And they'll be like, oh, I get it. Either that or have them watch the entire Not Just Bikes catalog. But uh, yeah, fuel is gonna get more expensive. Trucking's gonna kind of decline. Rail will pick up the slack. And that might even, you know, the freight companies, you know, Union Pacific might even bring the Tennessee Pass back themselves. Because they're like, hey, man, like, we need to have, like, even if the Moffat Tunnel isn't at capacity, they might say, hey, like, we're picking up all this extra traffic and, you know, it's, you know, on-time delivery priority Amazon Prime traffic. You know, the Tennessee Pass is a shortcut if you're going that way. You know, it is the hypotenuse of the Colorado Triangle, and the hypotenuse is always shorter than the combined length of the two legs so yeah, there could be a world in which the pass is brought back because, you know, even Union Pacific's like, hey, we need this thing for capacity. And uh, we do need to see like kind of the older generation that's running these companies and the, the older generation that's, you know, whenever you mention Amtrak or rail, they're like, ah, it could cost too much. I could spend that money on highways. I mean, I think we've learned that, you know, throwing more money is at highways, throw, throwing more money at highways is not a winning strategy. And you know, it's the cheap dad complex of like, ah, seems pretty nice, but who's gonna pay for it or how much it costs? And then the question is, well, how much does it cost if we don't do anything and just, you know, maintain the status quo? And we're learning that the cost of maintaining the status quo is actually pretty gosh darn high, which is a problem. Um, So yeah, we're gonna see more high-speed rail in this country, or at least rail, like, I'll take regional rail before I'll take high-speed rail, you know. We just need to connect point A to point B. And um, yeah, railroad jobs, passenger and freight. You know, it seems like it's a very elite and privileged position to say, I, rich NIMBY, do not wanna see any rail line reactivated nearby me because I have my hedge funds and my trust funds and my retirement, I'm fine. Therefore, I do not believe anyone should do anything with this rail line because I will get no benefit of it. I will get no use out of it. Therefore, I will use my power and position and influence to ensure nothing ever happens and my little beautiful bubble world stays untouched. Meanwhile, all the people around them are like, well, gee, thanks, dude. You know, you might never have gotten a use out of it. And you might be financially secure on your own right, but what about the rest of us little people? Do, do we count for nothing? I mean, 
we're the little people working, you know, we're the baristas, we're the lifties, we're the river guides, we're the ones that make this entire valley desirable in the first place that drives your property value up. I mean, and that's like the duality. Like people are like, ah, oh, it'll ruin my property value. I don't want to see a train roll by my window. It's like, don't you want your property value to go down so you pay less taxes? Because typically if you're a wealthy NIMBY, you tend to be concerned with things like property tax. So wouldn't you like any excuse to reduce your property taxes, even though access to transit historically always increases property values? Maybe that's maybe that's like their, you know, 4D chess movement. Like they understand that transit is good and they understand that if a rail line is brought back, it will increase property values and they don't want to see their taxes go up. Needless to say, all of their intentions are incredibly selfish and short-sighted. But, uh, you know, I don't want to say it's older generations particularly because there are a handful of wealthy young folks, but just on average, the older generations seem to be more opposed to any type of change, which kind of has always been true in any point in our history. It's just one of those things like, you know, to, to keep grandma and grandpa happy, look at all the, look at the price the rest of society has to pay to uh, maintain the, like their perfect vision of reality. And don't tell me that's not like an incredibly self-serving, self-interested perspective to maintain. Like it's coddling. Like how long are we gonna coddle the older generation saying, it's fine, it's fine. We're not gonna change. We're just gonna do things the way we've always done them. Um, and then you'll keep, even though we're bankrupting ourselves and running ourselves into extreme debt and poverty, you guys who are very well off and always lived a very comfortable lifestyle, you guys get to continue to maintain that comfortable lifestyle. Don't worry about the people who are never going to retire and who are never going to have, you know, the statistic is, is that when boomers were like in their late twenties, early thirties, they controlled 20% of the wealth in the economy. When Gen Z, no, not Gen Z, Gen X, yeah. When Gen X, after the boomers, when they were in their late 20s and early 30s, they controlled 10% of the wealth in the economy. When millennials, actually the, the, Gen, the Gen X was 9%. When the millennials are, which we are now in our late 20s and early 30s, we control a, a little bit less than 5% of the wealth in the economy. And for Gen Z, it's looking even worse. So the younger generations are poorer and poorer and poorer. The older generations are maintaining their comfortable lifestyle, usually at the expense of everyone else, which is really frustrating and annoying. Um, and, but the thing is that, you know, the boomers won't be around forever. And once they're gone, Maybe we can start to make these changes, which I know sounds very fatalistic and very morbid, but you know, it's usually said that good ideas don't win because they convince their opponents. Good ideas win because their opponents either give up or die. That's kind of always been true um, because you spend a lot of time and effort fighting people, you know, for a alternative view of the world. And that's really, really tough to, uh, that's a tough sell. So usually they just get tired of fighting or, you know, we just, one day we outnumber them in the polls and we can vote for the things we want and they can vote against us all they want. But when we outnumber them, you know, maybe we can do something different. So all we need to do is, you know, have this rail line hold out just a little bit longer and not get ripped up by those, uh, those NIMBYs and, and elitists in Eagle County, uh, the ones that want to see the entire thing ripped up. They're so short-sighted and they don't know how trains work and they, they just see the thing as a threat to themselves and their cost of living and their way of life. Um, it's like the people who live in Vail, I'm gonna take a second to talk about like the part of the Tennessee Pass that runs through uh, Eagle County. It's like, if I were in charge of the, Eagle, of the uh, Tennessee Pass tomorrow and I had, you know, all the money I needed to fix it up and buy whatever rolling stock I needed and build whatever stations. What I would do is that the first section of the Tennessee Pass I'd bring back would be from Dotsero to Vail, right where I-70 turns off. I would build stations at the Eagle County Airport and Eagle itself. 
maybe go up to mid turn a little bit past fail. Um, and depending on what it would, what would make more sense, I'd either have like a right at where the Tennessee Pass passes I-70, where the two go separate ways, I'd have a station there and a bus terminal that would run up into Vail. And the idea is that this would be a commuter rail line for ski area employees and other employees that work, you know, at coffee shops in Vail. And you'd have, an, you know, it's about a 35 mile section of railway and you would take all those cars off the road. You would free up all that parking in Vail, which I would hope would be turned into something else other than parking, but hey, we'll free up the parking, you know, on day one. And then maybe, you know, if you ever had the money, you know, somehow build a branch off of the Tennessee Pass that would go up into Vail proper and then put in a proper rail station there. But, you know, have a lighter rail vehicle, something like the Stadler or Alstom Fleur, you know, basically set up a commuter rail system. That'd be like phase one. And then phase two would be extending it all the way up to Leadville. So that way, you know, you could ride from Leadville to, um, is it Copper or Cooper? The one at the top of the Tennessee Pass, like the actual skier up there. I think it's Cooper. Um, but then basically have a rail line express shuttle for ski area employees and um, service industry employees that work at those various areas. That would be like my day one build. And you would create jobs locally. You know, someone's got to run the train. Someone's got to man the stations. If there's a bus route between that I-70 turnoff and Vail, there'd be a bus driver there, probably a couple of buses. But it would relieve traffic, it would reduce pollution. Uh, I'm sure Vail would hate it. They'd see it as a waste of their ta their millions and millions of taxpayer dollars because they're all freaking billionaires up in Vail. But to those lowly peasants, you know, the ones that make Vail run, the ones that got run out of town during COVID, they would now have an alternative to getting to work other than risking employee housing, which they saw how that went last time. But now they could live, you know, somewhere else in Eagle and then ride a train up into Vail, you know, just so they can start their work day. And other people who are, who are not wealthy enough to stay in Vail proper to go skiing that stay elsewhere in Eagle, well, now they could ride a train up into Vail and enjoy their day of skiing without spending the first part of their day stuck in a traffic jam. So that would be my phase one of, um, you know, reactivating the Tennessee Pass. It would be, it, it wouldn't even be in Salida or BV where I lived. It would be over in Eagle County. Um, it would be building basically a ski commuter train right along the Eagle River. And I'm sure people in Vail would be kicking and screaming, like public transit for the peasants? Ah, the audacity. We spent a lot of our lives exploiting poor people to get this wealthy, and we're not gonna stop now. I mean, that might be a bit harsh, but you know, I do find it funny when you've got like a, a, a retired BP oil executive who owns his fourth mansion in Vail, all of a sudden is opposed to rail reactivation because of environmental concerns. Meanwhile, his dirty oil money is what paid for those houses. It's like, talk about hypocrisy. So just, just be aware of that, people, you know. I, this is a controversial opinion, but I sometimes say, you know, no one ever got rich doing honest work. You usually were exploiting someone or something, whether it was the environment, people, usually both. And it's those people that have the wealth and the power that typically don't want anything to happen or change because they're worried about their property values and they're worried about, you know, seeing a train run past their house because they have never taken public transit a day in their life. They're bewildered why everyone isn't just buying Teslas if they're worried about the climate. They have no idea where cobalt comes from or how it's mined. They're living in a bubble. They're living in a very elitist, you know, they might claim to be environmentalists, but they're only really an environmentalist because currently it's convenient for them, or at least they perceive it to be convenient. Because, you know, rail does increase the property value and the desirability of a location. You know, many people live near the Northeast Corridor, can't see themselves living anywhere else, which is kind of funny. It's like, when, if you build it, they will come and they will like it. But yeah, all those very wealthy, retired, rich NIMBYs, you know, basically saying like, I don't ever see myself using this, so 
I don't want to pay for it, or even if they don't have to pay for it, I don't want to see it happen. It would be a minor inconvenience to my already very lavish, luxury, comfortable lifestyle. Or it's like, you know, <laughs> some people when they get older, especially if they're wealthy, they start to worry about their legacy. Like, you know, the life they left behind, and that might be why they're suddenly clinging to environmentalism. But um, when the history books are written, you know, I don't want to say about the boomers because it's, you know, they're not the only ones. But when the history books are written about the actions of NIMBYs and the, throughout history, they are not going to be remembered kindly. They are not going to be put in a nice light. It's supposed to be like, well, you know, a lot of people suffered and a lot of environmental damage was done because these people, you know, were too selfish and arrogant and self-important to let anything happen that could ever possibly inconvenience them. So we literally had to wait for them to die to get anything done. If you've made it this far in this podcast, I hope you'll forgive me for being kind of dramatic. But also, if you're listening this far in this podcast, you probably feel somewhat similar. Like, yeah, there's a lot of people out there who are never going to let anything happen while they're alive. Like, literally over my dead body. To which the younger generation say, okay, I can wait. Keep drinking Diet Coke and eating steak every night. Which is, you know, so funny. In its own health-consciously minded way. But uh, it does seem as though hopefully level heads preside and people always vote with their wallet and people don't like high gas prices and with the world events going on right now, I don't see fuel prices going down anytime soon. Especially as more and more environmentally friendly policies of which some people would, you know, very much so argue that uh, hold and... We continue to see the decline of oil as our primary mode of transit and our primary mode of energy. Because that's the thing about car dependent infrastructure. It was a fantastic party trick at the time when the roads were new, gas was cheap, and the suburbs were just being built. It was like a it was like a magic trick. Wow, how'd this happen? But you know, if anyone plays D&D, it's like a cursed item. It's like it'll give you a, a, a huge buff, uh, buff momentarily. It's like this sword will increase your attack by 300% for the next two moves. But afterwards, your speed is reduced by 90% till the end of the campaign. Which is kind of what America did. You know, we completely... <laughs> We, we, uh, we bet the entire country on a cursed power-up, which was, whoa, it made one hell of a show in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Then the oil shock was kind of like the first time that we started to see the um, nasty side effects of our choices, and it's only gotten worse since then. But uh, yeah, we, uh, we used a cursed power-up on the entire country, and now... The younger generations are going to be responsible for fixing the issues that those before us created, which again is just kind of a, you know, an element of the human experience, I guess you could say. The younger generations will always see themselves as fixing the problems that others claimed, like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And then people say, well, it is broke and we should fix it. And we spend most of our lives arguing about that. And the people who keep on telling there's not, us there's nothing wrong with us finally, well, conveniently um, go on to the next life. And then we're left fixing the problem. I do wonder what you know future generations will think of millennials and Gen Z and some Gen X. When it's like, wow, you know, those people like, yeah, there were a lot of TikTok warriors and, you know, a bunch of cringy stuff with that whole social media thing. But a handful of them, you know, really took it upon themselves to, you know fix a lot of stuff that they inherited because if the greatest generation in the boomers inherited America's very comprehensive rail network that they had been building from 1850 to 1950 they squandered their inheritance scrapped it built a bunch of cheap stupid highways and then millennials and gen z it's like well here's your inheritance it's like <laughs> our grandparents inheritance was a lot better than this that was a, that's the railroads we have left 
But, uh, you know, thanks for this massive, stupid highway network that is overbuilt and completely unnecessary and very inefficient. Uh, do you mind, hope you don't mind if we, like, you know, rip this thing up, like the same way how you guys ripped up all the rail lines. Because that, that'll be a turning point. I mean, we already see it with, like, cities removing highways and um, towns, you know, blocking off streets. It's like we're starting to see, you know, the tide is turning. You know, roads have been in a state of expansion for a very long time. And yes, we are still building new highways. I don't know why. Um, and like the highways cost billions and billions of dollars, but no one talks about that. Meanwhile, California high-speed rail is like, we need a little bit more money to keep the lights on. It's like, ah, this, this boondoggle waste of money. Or it's like the real boondoggle waste of money. It's the thing we're still dumping billions and billions and billions of dollars in, which is the U.S. highway network. So I hope to live an era in which with what, what was done to the railroads in the 50s and 60s, when a lot of them got ripped up and closed down, I want to see that happen to the highways, which is going to be, you know, more of a scalpel than a machete. But we already are kind of seeing that with urban freeways being shut down and replaced with, you know, parks and walkable corridors. Like, it's a slow process. And the thing about a lot of good urban design and good transit is that in a way, it's kind of like a virus, but a good virus because it infects a certain area, changes hearts and minds. They start to build their world around it. And then those who have it are like, this is great. We need more and we need to make this better. And then those who don't have it, if they happen to visit that, that area are like, wow, this is actually having, you know, touched it, smelled it, walked through it, experienced it. Even the hardest of hearts would be, unless they're like, I can't park my F-250 because there's no space, these goddamn communists. You know, whatever they want to say. But uh, once they experience it, they'll be like, wow, how, can we do a little bit of this in our hometown? And even if that's like, you know, closing off one street and, you know, putting tables out on the street so people can have a cafe experience outside, it's progress. And as we know with viruses, viruses tend to propagate exponentially so for those who say it's never going to happen and it not in our lifetimes the damage is too great even if we start right now those people are usually using a very um conservative linear projections they don't see like hey like this thing is a movement this thing will pick up momentum and speed and as more of the opponents move on from this world and the younger generations are able to do what they want, I wouldn't be surprised if this entire country becomes a much more comfortable, efficient, environmentally friendly, walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented place. Like, I have hope, and I know they say hope is a beggar. But still, it's like I've seen attitudes change. And really, it's less about me arguing points here or there on YouTube it's more about people actually experiencing this. Like I said, if you could just buy a ticket to Europe, just throw a dart on the map, and as long as it's not, you know, someplace in England that looks a lot like the US, you send any, you know, urbanist denier, transit denier, climate change denier to anywhere in Europe and have them walk around for two weeks. Honestly, if like you could have them stay there for like three weeks or like a month, like long enough where it's not like the, the the honeymoon period of the vacation wears off and they start to do things like, I'm going to go get groceries or I'm going to go meet up with some friends that I've met here. That's when they're like, holy shit, this is awesome. And they'll see, like, people are starting to fall out of love with their cars because, you know, cars are kind of an abusive relationship. It's a very one-sided relationship. People are starting to realize that, like, this isn't cheap and fun anymore. It's the difference between driving and commuting. Like, Driving cross country through canyon roads and you know into the outback and Moab and all that jazz, that's fun. That's enjoyable. But you know, using your car to go to eight separate locations in your city, running errands, being stuck in gridlock traffic the entire time, that's miserable. And I think everyone's realized that. And they keep on trying to like say, well, I just need to move to the newest suburb that has the newest power center where no one lives yet, and I'll be able to do this all in five minutes. And then they get there and they realize, oh wait. I wasn't the only one who had that idea. Hmm. Well, wish I could go a bit further on that, but I'm about where I need to be. So I'm going to sign off here. Uh, hope you guys are all doing well, and uh, please let me know what you think of my 
attitude towards the future of America. See ya.